I want to show you something here. Um, there it is. So this is my updated Festival of the Dead, which I've shown you some of, but I've never shown you the whole interesting story. Here we go. The devil. Notice what the devil holds in his hand. The same thing the angel, the, the, the destroying angel holds in his hand in the other tarot card image. And um, notice what he has on his belly. What is that the sign of? Taurus, yes. What's the connection? Well, it does look like Mercury because it's sitting on top of a cross. But if you actually look at it, that's, you know, you've got the Templar cross right there. And on top of it is the sign for Taurus. If you look at this symbol for Mercury, it's a little different. But this was how often they drew the sign for Taurus, like this with one continuous. Mm -hmm. So, what's the connection with Taurus right there? The Taurids, exactly, exactly. And this whole Day of the Dead presentation is about the Taurids. And this was the introduction to, you know, the Christian concept of the devil, which I'm suggesting is totally different from what most most Christians imagine it to be. The devil's a man-made invention. Right, but initially it was a symbol. The devil was a symbol. And this, this, what I've done here, I don't think you've seen this before, but this is an analysis of the, some of the original Greek and Hebrew describing sa Satan and Lucifer and the fall of Lucifer. We'll save that for another, one, another time. It was not my intent to digress off into the Taurid meteor shower right now. I just wanted to show you that image of the devil and how it had the same element as this. Now, of course, here the destroying angel is shown with the flaming torch in one hand and the pitcher of water. So what we have here is the symbol for the ekporosis, which is this, and the cataclysmos, the, the destruction of the world by water, symbolized here. And then, of course, we have two signs of the zodiac, which would be Leo and Scorpio, the eagle. You see it in, in Aquarius, the symbology, the water is the universal womb, and the glyph is the thought behind creation. Oh, sure, and, I, and none of what I'm saying denies that that's a legitimate interpretation. What you have to bear in mind with occult symbology is that the meanings are layered. There are moral meanings, there are scientific meanings, there are, meanings, there are metaphysical meanings, and there are physical. There's the metaphysics of it, then there's the physics of it. On one level, what we're talking about here, and what I, you know, the way I look at the tarot cards is that the tarot cards represent essentially the a symbolic way of representing the cosmic history of the world. Look at the feet too. Yeah, and you've got one, and that's straight out of the book of Revelations with the angel having one foot on land and one foot in the water. But see, it's the same thing. I mean, the, the Christian concept of the, the, the baptism is about the rebirth out of the waters, and it definitely represents... See, to the occult philosopher, you look at the analogies in nature. The breaking of the water at the time of birth is the same as the breaking of the fountains of the great deep on, on a macro level and, and the rebirth of a new age of the world accompanied by the breaking of the water which is the the breaking up of the fountains of the great deep so what you're saying you, it's in you know in metaphysics and occult philosophy to say that a symbol has one meaning doesn't then exclude that there are other meanings as well and to get to the whole essence of it, you take all those meanings. So, yeah, when you talk about the Great Flood, certainly there is a component that, that associates with the baptism, the immersion in the water, because that's what the Great Flood was. It was the immersion of the water, of the world, into the water, in the rebirth of a new age of the world coming out of that water. The baptism is the same thing, except you are reenacting in the individual microcosm this rebirth out of the waters of the flood. And so you're immersed into the water. And, and the analogy has been made by the ancient commentators between the great flood and the breaking of the waters, the breaking of the, and the, the discharge of the amniotic fluid. And I think that's a perfectly valid correlation because it does represent the idea on the individual scale of, you know, the, the, 
the emergence into a, a new realm of being, a birth, if you will, and that's how they saw, the ancient people saw that connection between the waters that accompanied the birth of, of new life, new human life, and the waters that accompanied the, the birth of a new world age. After all, Manly Paul P. Hall does say, symbols are oracular forms, mysterious patterns creating vortices in the substances of the invisible world. They are centers of a mighty force, figures pregnant with an awful power, which when properly fashioned, loose, fiery whirlwinds upon the earth. Now he's talking in a purely metaphysical sense, and the reason I put this in here is because I believe it has a perfect physical counterpart. Okay, so when we go back to many of the ancient traditions, and, and speaking of this whole concept of, of birth and death, we have Isis giving birth to Horus. Isis was described in the ancient writings as the queen of heaven, like here by Apuleius from the Metamorphosis or the Golden Ass. And read that. See, in the ancient writings, Isis was described as the queen of heaven. Um, here, from the descent of Inanna, Sumerian, circa 2000 BC. Could, you did such a good job. Try again. Linda. Right. When Inanna arrived at the outer gates of the underworld, she knocked loudly. She cried out in a fierce voice, Open the door, gatekeeper. Open the door, Nettie. I alone would enter. Who are you? She answered, I am Ananda, queen of heaven, on my way to the east. Notice, we go Sumerian, Inanna is the counterpart of Isis. Both described as the queen of heaven by the ancient authors. Oh, the oldest would be the Sumerian, Inanna. Although, actually, Inanna and Isis were roughly contemporaries, they were counterparts of each other. Now, when the Christians took over, they took all of the pagan gods and Christianized them. So here we have Isis, Queen of Heaven, with infant Horus. The whole Christian changed the symbolism. Retorted it. Well, no, not so much. I mean, really, I think what it did was just took it and dressed it up in a new suit of clothes. But underlying that, it's the same essential symbolism. I mean, let's look here, I think. Okay, take a look. Here is the Virgin Mary. Notice, look at the image there, right? And, you know, it's not a big stretch to essentially say that's nothing more than a Christianized Isis. And, in fact, even with the attempt, even you'll notice what I'm saying there. Note the eight-pointed star of Isis. Yeah. You were about to point that out, weren't you? Yes, that eight-pointed star has always just been as, was traditionally associated with Isis. And the planet Venus. And the planet Venus. So whoever, whoever designed this was obviously schooled in the occult interpretation of these Christian symbols. Oh, yeah, this is, this is actually a very, this is very powerful here when you begin to study it and look at it. We can look at this in more detail. I don't want to, we're running out of time, I think. But, but yeah, my, thank you. Thank you. That's, I would say that that would probably be a legitimate interpretation to Trinity. My point being is that. That means Mary became the queen of the heaven. The queen of heaven. Yes. Then we get to, and see what I've said here, surrounded by hermetic symbols. And then we have. The story of Le Don, which is actually the French pronunciation. Most of us in America say Lourdes, but it's Le Don. But this is the grotto. And how many of you have heard the story of what happened at Lourdes or Le Don? Yeah. And the, the, you know, actually, no, the movie was fairly accurate retelling yeah. of the, I mean, I read 
I visited there and got several historical academic accounts of the events and reconstruction and the movie was actually fairly close to what they said. There was a guy who wrote a book um, that the movie was based on and his, he attempted in his book to do you know authentic research. But, and I don't know if this, if this line was in the movie, but you know when they asked her what the lady said, the lady said she was the queen of heaven. So she used the identical n nomenclature for herself as Inanna and Isis. And she appeared in this grotto. So right there, that to me, that was interesting because there's a geological component to this. That is why it's so controversial because she said Queen of Heaven. She didn't say she didn't Mary. Mary. Exactly. That's so yes. That's why they all on her. That, yeah. Did you hear what she said? Because of the fact that she described herself as the Queen of Heaven, that was one reason why it was controversial. And she was almost, you know, excommunicated. Actually, if you you know. Rent the movie. There was the movie was made in the 1940s, probably, yeah. black and white, yeah. but it gives you a good, pretty accurate retelling of, of the story. I mean, she was like, what was she, 14, 15, Bernadette? I think 14 or 15 years old when she first had her visions, and um, some very interesting That's stuff. The, name of the, movie. Um, the song of Bernadette. Well, give us a fast overall of that. I've forgotten some of it. What happened or whatever? Well, she had a succession of these visions. Okay. And she reported these visions to her family and stuff, and the word got out. And pretty soon, every time she would go have a vision, this, this shining lady in white, the queen of heaven, would tell her to come back 30 days hence, which she would do, and she would come back. And then eat. <laughs> right. And as she, as she went back, the crowds grew each time until finally there were thousands of people. And one of the priests, who was a, a horticulturist, who was also a skeptic, played in the movie by um, one of my favorite, uh, Charles Bickford. Yeah, one of my favorite supporting actors. Real, real good job, I remember he did in the movie. He was a skeptic, and he said, well, if she really is the queen of heaven and she can do miraculous things, have her make this rose bush bloom, I don't remember the month, August? Maybe I should know this, but December. December. Yeah, it was it was a month when it wasn't supposed to bloom. So she said, "Okay, she'll she'll make that request." So she goes there, and the authorities are there. The authorities are actually wanting to put her in jail because they believe that all these people following her and everything is going to, you know, disrupt their their nice hierarchy of 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 power. Exactly, exactly. So I think there was about. There was thousands, several thousand people there. She goes down and she makes this request of this, the, the, the vision that's in this grotto that only she can see. And um, instead, the, 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 the lady in the grotto tells her to go and eat of the plants. And so she goes and she starts eating these plants, and then she says, eat the mud. So she starts actually eating dirt from the ground below this grotto. And... Then everybody is there, like, you know, well, see, then all the authorities are saying, see, we told you she was nuts. She's just a nutcase. So everybody left, and she was totally discredited. But after everybody left, the ground opens up, and this huge spring comes gushing out from right where she had been eating the dirt. And that spring is there. I mean, you can go, and it's a magnificent spring just gushing out of the ground. And, you know, there are thousands of pilgrims there at this site, and they go and they bathe in this water. And if you go and outside the grotto, you probably can't see it in this photograph, but just outside the grotto, up in the trees and on the rock sites, there's crutches and canes and all kinds of stuff hanging there that people left, you know, that came in, bathed in the waters and were healed, and then they left their crutches. Did the rose bush bloom? No, the rose bush didn't bloom. But you know what's interesting is like Guadalupe Mary. They found a church on top of a mountain where a rose bush was blooming when it should not have been, and they took it to the the big muckety muck from the Catholic Church, and he didn't believe it, and they kept doing it. And finally, they went up there and said, "This is a miracle," and bing bang boom. Yes, I seem to recall it because we, on our trip in June, Brad and I visited a place down in New Mexico that was a supposedly a site of a visitation. What I have done here is I've gotten together some of the 
the prophecies that are in these visions. There's a, a number of these Catholic saints. And as I say here, the fact that the institution of the Roman Catholic Church has appropriated these events for their own purposes should not deter us from trying to perceive the underlying reality behind what appear to be authentic and inexplicable experiences. Shorn of ecclesiastical trappings, the events described in the following accounts have characteristics that reveal them to be part of the universal metaphysical experience of mankind. The fact of association and correspondence between visions of mystics and prophets through the ages with the kind of natural events described herein should be enough to provoke considerable interest and further investigation. One might not be far off the mark to surmise that memories of world-destroying cosmic fires have left an indelible impression on the collective psyche of man. And now, this is only a small sampling of what you find when you begin to go into some of these visionary experiences. We see here a globe of light. If you recall, in the Peshtigo story, many of them described a globe of light or a globe of fire coming down and then bursting. Um, notice here, this is the vision of Our, Our Lady of La Salette, 19th of September, 1846. This was the, Melanie Calvat and Maxima, Maximin Girard were two children. Now you notice how many of these visions appear to children? Because children yeah, their, their, their consciousness is not, is not yeah, obscured by dogmas and belief systems. Right. So Melanie was 14, Maximin was 11. They were watching cattle in a pasture when they saw a globe of light. My suspicion is they probably ate some mushrooms out of a cow pie. No, not really. Um, um, okay. A globe of light. Well, yeah, because he was drawing. I believe, if I recall, wasn't he drawing upon some of these archetypes? How the w woman is described coming in a globe of light? Maybe so. So, notice here, around her neck was a crucifix that depicted the instruments of the passion, and on her head were a cap and roses. She sat on a rock with her face in her hands, weeping. Now, when I read that, the first thing I thought of was the depictions in masonry of the weeping virgin, weeping over the broken column which I've shown you this before. But, and of course here they say in, from the Catholic Planet, which is a, a um, website you can go to, of course they interpret it as the Virgin Mary, which is pretty much what they always do. Um, so if you go into what these visions, they're very interesting and they're, they're very consistent. The leaders, the guides of the people of God, have neglected prayer and penance, and the demon has obscured their intelligence. They have become these wandering stars that the old devil will drag along with his tail to make them perish. Well, what the hell does that sound like? I've tried to show you that the devil is a metaphor for the comet. Comets have tails, right? And in those tails are what? Those are the swarms of the demons. Society is on the eve of the most terrible scourges and of the greatest of events. One must be expected to be ruled with an iron rod and to drink the chalice of the wrath of God. Now, you'll notice the things that I've underlined. Every one of the things I've underlined, wandering stars, the old devil dragging along with his tail, the chalice, the iron rod, the lightning sword, every one of those have been used as symbols for cosmic encounters with comets, right, exactly, every one of them. So is this somebody who's gotten onto some very archetypal level of reality and is getting all of this imagery, this universal imagery? The seasons will be changed. The stars will lose their regular movements. The moon will reflect only a feeble reddish light. Water and fire will give to the globe of the earth convulsive movements and horrible earthquakes which will cause to be engulfed mountain cities. The demons of the air with the Antichrist will perform great wonders on earth and in the air. Fire from heaven will fall and will consume three cities. All the universe will be struck with terror. Well, if you've been paying attention during all of these lessons and the discussions of the 
you know, the firestorms and all, you can't help but see the parallels. Now, the demons of the air with the Antichrist, I don't think we've discussed the Antichrist at all in here. But when you go into the, the, the tales of the Antichrist, you know the Antichrist that shows up in the book of Revelations is only like the final chapter. There's a whole corpus of, of apocalyptic literature that talks about the Antichrist. And it's only like one small piece of that that we've got, you know, in the Bible. And so those are, that's what the people are aware of. But when you go into this, this corpus of, of stories about the Antichrist, you realize that there's more to, more to the Antichrist than meets the eye. And the Antichrist being a counterpart for the devil. And in the book of Revelations, you know, the Antichrist is described as being a dragon. And we know right off, we know that the dragon was a symbol for what, Bill? Draco. Well, well and, the and the earth energy is it's a, it's a symbol of many things. Earth energy is a comet. Comets. Comets. In this context, comets. Yes. Well, in the earth energies, if you recall, I was trying to make the connection between that because the earth energies are following the pattern of fault lines. The fault lines in the earth are created by the great impacts. And, and the earth energy shift when, uh, when things get uh, uh, pretty much in a jumble, the earth energy shift with the new uh, pattern. So this is just discussing some of the Catholic saints and their visions, and I think, how much time we got left? Ten minutes? Yeah, about ten minutes. Okay. Well, they are, they're good, but I, you know, I'll let you read this on your own. The sky will be on fire. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? Uh, during these three days of darkness, let the blessed candle be lighted everywhere. No other light will shine. Okay, so let's, let's see, let's, okay, so this is an account of what happened associated with the Peshtigo fire. Um, back in, there was an author by the name of Xavier Mark. He was a prominent politician and real estate dealer in Green Bay. He was a young member of the first group of Belgians who set out from, for Wisconsin from Antwerp aboard a three-masted sailing ship in 1853. On August 15th, 1858, there occurred what Martin described as an alleged miracle, which made quite a noise at the time. A young woman, Adele Bryce, had been to Mass at the Bay Settlement. Walking home, she was in the vicinity of Robbinsville when, by her account, she saw a vision of the Virgin Mary standing between two trees. The vision addressed her, speaking in French, telling her to build a chapel on that sacred spot. Now, the date, August 15th. What is significant about August 15th? Which one? No. No. Perseids. Very good. So the first vision occurs on the peak of the Perseids. Okay, make a note. Uh, according to Martin, the church authorities were skeptical, as they always are, and declared the apparition a myth and an imposition, just like with Bernadette. When Adele refused to cease talking about it, she was refused communion. But many of the settlers sided with, with Bryce, and they flocked to the site. Services were held, although at first no priest would attend. Finally, the bishop permitted a small chapel to be built. This was soon followed by a boarding school, a larger chapel, a church, and a convent. Pilgrims came from miles around, and some of them claimed to have been cured of their ailments. Now here's a map of the area. Here's Green Bay, here's the Door Peninsula, Peshtigo is right there. When the fires broke out, people in Green Bay survived, but the fires started here and swept up the peninsula and started here and swept up the coast. This place that we're talking about is right where I've put that star. That was where the vision of Adele Bryce was, right where that star is. If we look at a closer view of it, that's right there where that star. So you can actually go visit this, this spot that we're, we're talking about here. What is it? Now there's, let's see, I think I have a picture what, of what's there now. It's probably in, this, in the story. Okay. Without going into the details of the event and its result, I will simply say that for several years this young woman met with considerable opposition 
from the clergy of the diocese, who publicly declared that the alleged apparition was a myth and an imposition. I have the word apparition underlined. Why? Because how, how do scientists describe the appearance of a comet as an apparition? They, so, same word, okay? For a time, even the Holy Sacrament was refused to the girl for the perseverance with which she made her assertion. However, in spite of all opposition, the multitude would congregate on the spot and with Adele would worship and even say Mass on certain days without a priest. In the same year, a small chapel was built, afterwards a school. And within five years from the apparition, there was built a large chapel, a church, and a schoolhouse and convent in which boys and girls were educated. People came in large numbers to the sacred spot and to listen to Adele, who had changed from a bashful country girl, unlettered and unimposing, to a fiery teacher, preacher and teacher, whose perseverance and enthusiastic obedience to the voice heard only by her won her converts at every turn. For several years she met with opposition from the clergy, who declared her alleged apparition a myth. Adele persisted to tell of the vision, and the pilgrims to the mound between the trees increased in number. Why do I have the mound underlined? That's exactly what I'm thinking, and that's... But to have been on a sacred site. Yes. Finally, repeating the fate of St. Joan of Arc, Adele was refused the sacraments of the church and threatened with excommunication. But Adele's enthusiasm only increased. Mrs. Dion, a neighbor, donated five acres of ground, including the Holy Knoll, and Joseph Bryce, now reconciled to Adele's vocation, built a little chapel shrine, 10 by 12 feet. Adele prayed in her grief to the Blessed Lady of her vision to give external signs that the incredulous might know and believe. And the lame are said to have walked, the blind are said to have seen, and those troubled long by wasting disease have sought the help of the help of Christians and claim to have been made whole at the little wayside sanctuary. Wheelchairs have been abandoned and crutches and canes piled high in the chapel as mute testimony of the alleged cures at Wisconsin's Lourdes. Could it be that there's some kind of an unusual energy present at this site? We're going to a few different accounts here because each one has different details. Um, We'll skip this. This is just background. So she walked several miles to church each Sunday following an Indian trail. Now remember, Indian trail, yeah. Sacred, uh, sacred right. Way. Yes. Following an Indian trail that ran to Bay Settlement. On the morning of Sunday, April 15, 1858, Adele was passing through some woods in Robbinsville when she was overpowered by a vision that she later described to a nun who related it this way. There appeared between two trees, one a maple and one a hemlock. Significant detail, I think. Which stood for years after, a blinding white light which paralyzed the poor girl with fear. She cowered before it and prayed rapidly and breathlessly as the light took definite form. And between the trees stood a marvelously beautiful lady, clothed entirely in dazzling white garments, with no touch of color save a wide yellow sash or girdle. Her hair was auburn, her eyes deep and dark, and she bore a radiant and kindly smile. Adele trembled with fear. The vision faded gradually away. In this account, this says it's April. In the previous account, it's said August. Right, because she had multiple visions. Oh, okay. The next Sunday, she traveled the same route with companions to show them the spot. When they reached the two trees, Adele collapsed involuntarily to her knees as the vision reappeared, though her friends saw nothing unusual. When they arrived at the church, a priest advised her that if it happened again, she should ask the beatific lady why she had appeared. For the next several weeks, curious crowds followed Adele through the woods each Sunday, but nothing unusual happened. Then, on October 9th, 1859, her friends saw Adele once again fall to her knees between the maple and the hemlock and ask aloud, in the name of God, who are you and what do you wish of me? Now, obviously, everybody in here saw the significance of that date. 
The August 15th date was the peak of the Perseids. This is the peak of the Draconids. Let's see. Okay, so we're, we're going to another account. Since we're running out of time, I'm jumping over stuff. I just want to hit the, the, the important details here. Um, so one of the confessors that she went to, this priest, Father William Verhoff, I guess, bade her not to fear and to speak to him of this outside of the confessional. Father Verhoff told her that if it were a heavenly messenger, she would see it again and it would not harm her. After that, Adele had more courage. She's, okay, so now here's one of the, the later visions. She started home with her two companions, and a man was, who was clearing land for the Holy Cross Fathers at Bay Settlement accompanied them. As they approached the hallowed spot, Adele could see the beautiful lady, clothed in dazzling white, with a yellow sash around her waist. Her dress fell to her feet in graceful folds. She had a crown of stars around her head, and her long golden wavy hair fell loosely about her shoulders. Who is shown with a crown of stars around her head frequently? Yeah, Isis. And also we can see the, 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 uh, the high priestess in the tarot deck with the, with the no, the empress who represents Venus and uh, Isis with the crown of stars around. And I would guess Adele Bryce was not, had probably was not familiar with the tarot deck back in 1859. Overcome by this heavenly light and the beauty of her amiable visitor, Adele fell on her knees. In God's name, who are you and what do you want of me? asked Adele as she had been directed. And what does the heavenly woman say? Yeah. Yeah. So again, she doesn't say I'm the Virgin Mary. She says I'm the Queen of Heaven, just like Inanna and just like Isis. So... Now this is from the actual shrine, which is, okay, that's the question you want. The shrine of Our Lady of Good Help. You can actually find, they have a little website online, and you can actually, I've never visited this place, but I probably will next time I'm in Wisconsin. So now, what's the connection? We've seen already one connection with the Peshtigo fire, and that was the final vision that occurred on October 9th, right? In 1850. 1859, yes. Right, on October 9th, 1859, Adele Bryce had her third vision of the Blessed Virgin Mary. When the Blessed Mother spoke to Adele the third time, she warned, if they do not convert and do penance, my son will be obliged to punish them. So this would have been 12 years, almost to the day. Right? We do not propose to pass judgment on the reasons for this catastrophe, but one day short of 12 years after the Robbinsville apparition on October 8, 1871, the great calamity fell and a tragedy begat a miracle. The Belgian colony, which embraced a large part of the peninsula and included Robbinsville, was visited by the same whirlwind of fire and wind that devastated Peshtigo. When the tornado of fire approached Robbinsville, Sister Adele and her companions were determined not to abandon the chapel. Encircled by the inferno, the sisters, the children, area farmers, and their families fled to the shrine for protection. The statue of Mary was raised reverently and was processed around the sanctuary. When wind and fire threatened suffocation, they turned in another direction to hope and pray, saying the rosary. Hours later, rains came in a downpour, extinguishing the fiery fury outside the chapel. The Robbinsville area was destroyed and desolate, except for the convent, the school, the chapel, and the five acres of land consecrated to the Virgin Mary. Though the fire singed the chapel fence, it had not entered the chapel grounds. Also, my, the further research I did disclosed that apparently the rain only fell on the area of the chapel. What's more, the only livestock to survive the fire were the cattle brought to the chapel grounds by farmers and their families who came to the shrine seeking shelter from the firestorm. And now we have another very important clue. Though the chapel well was only a few feet deep, it gave the cattle outside all the water they needed to survive the fire, while many deeper wells in the area went dry. Hence, the chapel has been sometimes referred to as the miraculous well. 
In the days to follow the great fire, the poor Belgian pioneers needed no more proof that Mary's visit to Sister Adele was genuine. Notice, we've got what could be a possible Indian mound, referred to as the Sacred Knoll. The fact that it was on an Indian trail, and it's known that many of the Indian trails followed the sacred ley lines. We've also got a well, which we know had to have been deeply connected to the water table because it didn't go dry, and a lot of others did. So here's the connection with the, with the well or the spring once again. So in another account describing it, we see that the forest fire devastated the land all around them and spread right up to the fence surrounding their enclave, but did not leap over it. Their wooden school and church stood out like an island in the charred landscape. So there's a lot of very interesting elements to this story. Um, the fact that um, the, uh, the land completely around it was completely incinerated, but the five acres endured. Oh, okay, there it is, the Robbinsville Chapel today. The largest and most easily found chapel is on County Road K in Champion, Wisconsin. So uh, it was here that Sister Adele Bryce saw visions of the Blessed Virgin Mary in 1859. So if you want to go there, I've found exactly where it is. It's marked on Wisconsin maps. So this is the thing where we don't have time for, but this is a letter from one of the fire from a, a from a letter by Peshtigo fire survivor Phineas Eames to his brother one month after the fire this is a very interesting letter and he describes his account is loaded with very very potent information peculiar smell he describes many things that um let's see uh we will save this. Right. While standing a few feet from the door, all at once I saw a bright light approaching its size large as a half bushel measure. And as it came towards us, it appeared like a ball of fire approaching from the southeast. And I saw it pass directly over my head to the northwest, just high enough to clear the house. The night being so very dark as it passed over, it dazzled our eyes, and I watched it out of sight. All in the house saw the same light as it approached and disappeared from the windows. Next, we heard a tremendous explosion, which was so great that I can compare the sound to nothing I ever heard. So we'll pick up on that in two weeks. And then we're going to do take a little digression to um, what I'm proposing. The ancient tradition suggests that once this kind of knowledge and awareness um, becomes accessible to the human race, what are we supposed to do with it? Yeah, as we proceed now into this transition between the, the great month of Pisces into the great month of Aquarius, all of the new cosmic forces need to be reckoned with and incorporated into our plan for the future. So that's where I want to go with this in the next few meetings we have.